one. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is an exciting morning. We're talking about agribusiness, one of our favorite subjects. And we're very, very pleased to have with us this morning the Honorable Floyd Green, Minister of State in the Ministry of Industry, Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries, and what I call a passionate advocate of Jamaica's agricultural transformation. I hope you will agree with that title because I just bestowed it on him. So um, we're very pleased also to have with us my fellow JAMPRO colleagues, Norman Nair, Vice President of Sales and Promotion for JAMPRO, Marlene Porter, Manager for Agribusiness at JAMPRO, Miss Agribusiness, and then distinguished guests, Matthew Lynn, from Caribbean Broilers and Imagination Farms, Ricky Waite from um, Martha's, sorry, whoops, <laughs> they put up the, the agenda, thank you very much for putting that agenda up, from Valley Fruit Company, um, and Roger Turner from Tuller Estates. So we have an exciting program for you this morning where you will hear some of what Jampro's thinking is on um, the markets and products that we should be focusing on. And you will also hear from Honorable Floyd Green about uh, MICAF's really exciting program for how we are going to transform agriculture in our country. I think this is a great time. Oh, well, the ground rules, sorry. The ground rules, which you'll see on the screen, we are recording this webinar. All video and audio has been turned off for participants, so you are not allowed to speak, but you are allowed to type your questions in the question box if you have questions. Your questions will be answered by one of the panelists live or responded to in the box. Minister cannot stay with us for the entire proceedings, so we will take a couple of questions from Minister after his presentation. There will be no verbal questions allowed. So we're asking you all for the sake of order to um, respect these ground rules. So I wanted to say that I think that this is a great time to be talking about agribusiness because the unprecedented COVID period has really given us a wake up call if we needed one about the importance of food security and the urgent need to restructure and revitalize our agriculture to transform agriculture from a simple means of paying the bills into a thriving and inclusive agribusiness based on sustainable value chains from field to consumer, offering a comfortable lifestyle to small farmer and large scale farmer alike. I think that's really critical, that transformation we're talking about from agriculture to agribusiness. It's, it's really a sea change. During this period, Jamaica's agriculture has emerged and constant areas for providing investment and trade opportunities. MICAF has identified a number of key crops with the best potential for the local and international markets, such as yams, Irish potatoes, pumpkin, pepper, turmeric, small ruminants, well, it's not a crop, but it's a section of agriculture, pineapple, onion, ginger, mango, honey, and our high quality world famous cocoa and coffee. JAMPRO has commissioned market studies through Euromonitor for most of these products, so we know where the markets are, and Marlene will share some of that with you this morning. But as we keep on saying, we are far from achieving the true potential that Jamaica has. According to Deloitte Insights, fresh foods are the primary driver of growth in retail stores, as they account for 49% of all dollar sales growth in the fast moving consumer goods sector. Countries like Israel, Morocco, Argentina, Chile are making millions from fresh produce exports. So why aren't we? If you look at Costa Rica, a country that is comparable to us in size, in 2019, they exported 2.75 billion US dollars in fresh produce, leaving us in the dust. Consumer demand for fresh produce, as we know, is growing, fed by the trend towards healthy eating and the growing body of information about superfoods, among which figure breadfruit and avocado. Why aren't we creating the orchards we need with long-term potential for growth? This morning, we want to focus on the opportunities for roots and tubers, and I've mentioned already ginger, turmeric, Irish, and sweet potato, 
and for tree crops such as mango, avocado, ackee, breadfruit, which we have not developed into proper orchards. Look at ackee, our national dish, part of our national dish. Costa Rica and Haiti have orchards and continue to take our market share in the international market with better organized supply chains. But in addition to being suppliers of fresh produce, we feel that we must start to master complete value chains from field to consumer. We need to take advantage of the consumer trends towards convenience, healthy eating, organic produce, fair trade produce, and repackage our superfoods to lengthen their shelf life, offer a market for second grade produce and reduce spoilage. Vacuum packed roast breadfruit, yam, green banana, will keep our third generation diasporans enjoying Jamaican staple foods. We see these products now in our supermarkets. Vacuum packing removes the hassle of peeling, extends the lifespan, and adds a layer of protection from external sources and seals the flavors, texture, and moisture of the product in. Mastering the value chain means employing technology at every step of that value chain. Scientific methods of developing clean planting material of disease resistant varieties, ag tech in administering the right doses of inputs at the right times, drones to survey the fields and identify pests, deploying controlled environment methods such as hurricane resistant greenhouses. We must also educate ourselves about the global evolution in the markets we serve, implementing global quality standards such as global gap improving our logistics chains to supply the right product at the right time, addressing the financing challenges and managing local problems such as Pradia Larsni. We need a massive education campaign to develop agronomic skills in our young people. Starting in primary school, we can produce the next generation of young people who will understand that a farmer is not a man with a hoe, but a man or woman with a computer. You see, I'm gender neutral there. This is how we will get more young people to fall in love with agribusiness and to get involved. So ladies and gentlemen, as we move to adapt to the new normal, expand our agricultural productivity and grow the economy, Jampro recognizes the pivotal role we all must play in advancing the welfare of our country. Today, we continue the conversation towards that mission, the mission of transformation of our agriculture. Marlene is gonna talk about some of the key products and markets for some of our key crops in the future. But now I really want to thank you for joining us this morning because we really think that it is, you've come out in your numbers to hear us and we think we have an exciting message. And the best person to really kick us off with that exciting message is none other than Minister Floyd Green who comes from an agricultural area himself and who we know is a passionate advocate for the development and the transformation of this industry, which must lie at the heart of Jamaica's growth going forward. So Minister, a warm welcome to you and over to you to deliver your words to us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, our president of JAMPRO, Diane Edwards. You should be hearing me now. Yes, we're hearing yes, thank, you. Good. Thank you. Thank you, President. Um, great introduction. Norman Nara, our Vice President, Marlene Porter. I'm really looking forward to your presentation um, from our agribusiness department at JAMPRO. Other members of the private sector, Ricky Waits, Matthew Lynn, Roger Turner, and persons who have joined us from all over the world. Thank you for joining us here as we speak agriculture, as we speak agribusiness, and as we really speak about the future of Jamaica. First, I really want to commend and thank JAMPRO for leading us out with this initiative. JAMPRO is that arm of government that is constantly looking for investment and looking to move Jamaica forward. And they have identified that, um, especially coming out of this COVID crisis, they have to realign, reassess, and to ensure that their priority focus are on the areas which are right now in the demand and the areas that can really move us 
forward. So I know Jampro will continue to focus and enhance its focus on things like e-commerce, the global services sector, healthcare, biotechnology, renewable energy. And of course, I would say their main focus will now be on agribusiness. As you may have heard a little earlier, I will have to leave a little bit earlier. So I've decided to uh, cut my presentation short so that we can take some questions. I hope that I can run out and run back in if we're not finished in case there are additional questions. But what I plan to do is one, look at where we are in agriculture now. Um, how have we been able to maneuver the impacts of COVID-19? I will speak a little bit about our overarching policy and direction of the government. And then I will close off in relation to some of the specific things we're doing now to move agriculture and agribusiness forward. Just to put things in context, Jamaica has about 230,000 registered farmers and about 20,000 registered fisher folk. Clearly they span the length and breadth of our island, but we do have um, an, a number of areas that have the majority of our farmers. Clearly I am from the breadbasket, um, St. Elizabeth is so named because of our contribution towards production and um, the amount of farmers that we have. During the COVID-19 crisis, as most economies of the world, our economy did grind to, to a screeching halt. Our tourism sector, our hospitality sector, our restaurants, um, all had to adhere to the medical health guidelines and as such went through a period when they were not in operation. That largely meant that there was a significant fallout in the market for our farmers. A number of farmers, directly supply the tourism industry and supply that only, that's their only source of market and income. And as such, with the downturn in the tourism industry, we saw a significant impact on our farmers. Thankfully, and quite proactively, the government responded. So we did a number of things, partnering with our private sector. Um, through our initial stimulus program, we put about 200 and 40 million Jamaican dollars to help our agricultural sector, to help our farmers. We started a direct buyback program. So the farmers who had excess produce, what we went through our rural agricultural development agency, we went directly to the field, to the farm gate, and bought that excess produce from the farmers. We partnered with our private sector who had cold storage, who had refrigerated trucks to store and redistribute those produce. And importantly, we held a series of mobile markets right across the length and breadth of Jamaica, taking the produce into areas where we had a high demand, a high volume of people who wanted fresh produce. Um, that program saw significant um, return and really helped save our farmers, save our farmers through this period and ensure that they would have some resources to one, take care of their families, but more importantly, to be able to go back out into the field and to do what they love. Through our buyback program, we moved about 5 million pounds of fresh produce, um, impacted uh, at least 2,000 farmers, and it spanned across 11 parishes. So all in all, our farmers have been able to maneuver that period. And it was critical because based on what we have been doing for the last three years to streamline our agricultural sector, to encourage our farmers to get back into production, to support our farmers through direct programs, we have been seeing growth in agriculture. We did have two very difficult years where drought really wreaked havoc, but we said to our farmers not to lose hope and through initiatives such as the Ready one program we were able to give some small scale irrigation supply to put those farmers in a position to be you know, resistant to drought. And as such, we are started and have been started to reap the benefits of that. In fact, agriculture grew year on year by about 2%. But importantly, the last quarter, which is a quarter directly before going into the impact of COVID, agriculture grew by 7.8%. So, which means all in all, our agriculture sector is on a growth trajectory. And despite COVID-19 and the shocks to the supply chain, we want to keep it on that growth trajectory. Now, how can we do that? And this goes into the second part of my presentation. People often say, where is the plan in relation to agriculture? What's the overarching vision? What's the document that will guide what you do? Um, 
you know, there has been a number of plans over the years, but I don't think we have been able to bring them together into one cohesive document that says what will be your primary focus. And we fortunately took the policy decision to ask Jamper to lead the charge to pull together a national agribusiness strategy. And it was so termed because part of the vision is that we have to move agriculture from being seen as more of a social intervention program to be seen as a business. And as such, we asked Jampro to lead that charge to develop a national agribusiness strategy. And that was done. That was done last year. Jampro brought in a consultant and they developed the national agribusiness strategy, which is really a five-year national strategy around agriculture that really looks at social and economic transformation of the rural, rural economy, looks at varying business models and how can we develop supporting ecosystems to ensure food and nutritional security. The transition, the, the agribusiness strategy is supported by an 18-month transformation plan, which really seeks to fast track the incorporation of climate smart models to do things such as establish an agribusiness intelligent you, intelligence unit and to address the persistent challenges faced in distribution and storage capacity. What we have done in relation to that agribusiness strategy is that the strategy calls for an overarching national agribusiness council, which we have already established. I have the pleasure of chairing, which will pull together not only various ministries, agencies, and departments that deal with agriculture to one solid space, but will also incorporate the private sector, farmers, those who are actively involved in the business of agriculture. Part of what we realized across the public sector is that oftentimes across ministries, across agencies, there are silos, um, different people are working on the same thing and hence you have duplication of effort. We want to remove that in relation to agriculture and streamline what we do. So our five year national strategy and action plan does have some key strategic objectives. I'll just go through a couple of them. One is to ensure national food and national, national food and nutritional security through the appropriate deployment of the country's resources and facilitation of joint national public-private partnerships. So at the heart of our agribusiness strategy is public-private partnership. We are very clear. If we are to move agriculture in the way that agriculture needs to move, it cannot be the government alone. Part of the government's role and the, ma the major part of the government role is facilitating investment of the private sector and public-private partnership. We're reforming the support for agribusiness and food production to really develop a holistic ecosystem that is profitable and facilitates commercial farming enterprises. Again, agriculture is not social intervention. We see agriculture as a business. We want our farmers to make money and we want young people to be drawn to agriculture because you can develop a good life, a good way of life, and wealth out of agriculture. Part of our goal of the national agribusiness strategy is to sustain the rural economy by implementing re-engineered agribusiness models, supply chains, and value additional operations. Again, the reality. A number of our farmers go through periods of glut and shortage, but they're not real. You know, we have a glut of tomatoes in St. Elizabeth, but in Kingston, unfortunately, there's a shortage of tomatoes because of our logistic and distribution supply chains. More than that, worldwide, there is such a significant demand of Jamaican agricultural produce that we really should never have a glut. Once we're putting in place the right storage methods and the right distribution channels. So part of our agribusiness strategy is to deal with those longstanding storage and distribution issues. And finally, in relation to the agribusiness strategy, one of our priorities is to stimulate and catalyze innovation, investment, and commer commercialization across the entire sector to prepare adequate responses to climate change and value chain development. We'll just say well, what will be one of the main priority goals of the administration in relation to agriculture regarding the agribusiness strategy is really to enhance our research and development capabilities. We really want to ensure 
that working with our academic partners, that Jamaica is at the forefront as it used to be in relation to agricultural research. So that is the overarching framework, and that is what guides our development and how we're going to move forward for the next five years in relation to agriculture. Just to tell you quickly, we're not just talking about it. We haven't just put in a plan. We have also put our money where our mouth is. So coming out of our response to COVID, out of our budget post-COVID, well, we're still in the throes of COVID, but after the initial impact, when we had to realign our budget, we put an additional one billion Jamaican dollars to our agricultural sector. And that is really to drive things like our productivity and production incentive program where we help our farmers with inputs and markets for a number of select crops. We have selected Irish potato, onion, sweet potatoes, peppers, sweet corn, dasheen, cassava, yams, sorrel, spices, strawberry, pineapples, condiments, and also small ruminant development as the, the, the priority areas that we will be providing direct support. Last year, we spent about $565 million. We plan to increase that by at least $300 million this year. That $1 billion will also help us drive our expansion to irrigation. We are very aware that in order to have a sustainable agricultural model, our farmers have to have access to water. Already we're going to be providing some additional small irrigation kits. Already we have ordered two um, new water trucks to help in the delivery of water. And more importantly, we have two massive projects, um, over at least $500 million, which is in addition to the $1 billion, as I mentioned, of investment in the Essex Valley irrigation system and the South Clarendon irrigation system to bring water to farmers that now have to do without. We're also going to be focusing on plant health management, the fight against disease, including the tropical racehorse disease and the cocoa, the frosty pod rot disease, we will enhance those interventions. And finally, out of our $1 million, we're also going to put in some cold storage facilities, some refrigerated trucks, which we want to do as a public-private partnership, working with community farmers group to run those entities. So all in all, we are still in COVID-19, but despite the challenges, I think we saw a clear opportunity. And that opportunity was to encourage Jamaicans to consume more fresh produce. So through the work of the private sector, along with our ministry, we launched our Say Yes to Fresh campaign to say to Jamaicans, both here and abroad, consume local products, support our farmers. That has gone tremendously well. So while there was a crisis, is a crisis, what we see is a tremendous opportunity for us to enhance Jamaica's agricultural footprint worldwide by encouraging everybody to say yes to fresh. I look forward to your questions and I'm sure you will really enjoy the rest of this webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Minister. That was, I think, really pretty comprehensive about what MICAF is doing to transform agriculture and ag into agribusiness. So I see that there are a lot of questions um, in, the, in the chat. We're actually asking you to post your questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, but uh, there are a number of questions that we can try to take now. Um, one question, Minister, is does the ministry have a policy to ensure that case graduates are given land and startup capital mm -hmm. to start production? Tough question, but... Um, good, good question. So the ministry does have a policy in relation to um, securing land for youth farmers, right? Um, so as a part of our agri-parks, of our part of our agri-investment corporation, in every agri park that we establish, we secure a set amount of land. It varies depending on the size of the agri park for youth farmers. So that includes persons who would have gone to case and persons who do not have formal training in agriculture. So while there's no direct transition to say once you go to case, you qualify for the land, clearly once you have training in agriculture, you can apply to our agri-parks for that section that's reserved for farming. And we're continuing that policy, not just 
in the AIC, but across now our SCJ holdings. So as most people should be aware, as Jamaica right sizes its sugar industry, a lot of land that used to be in sugar becomes available. Again, in all of those developments, there are land specifically set aside for youth. So what I would say to a young person listening, interested in going into agriculture, wondering where the land can come from, approach the 4-H club. The 4-H club can point in the direction in relation to where is available land through the AIC, through the SCJ, and they can also point you into the availability of short-term grants, small grants, or longer-term loans. Thankfully now, more and more we see our DBJ, we see our um, commercial banks slowly in relation to the commercial banks, and I will say this much too slowly, turning the corner in relation to financing agriculture, but there are some grants available. So one, contact the 4-H Club. The 4-H Club is not just a school-based organization. The 4-H Club is the ministry's arm to incorporate young people into agriculture. And very soon, we'll be launching what we call a roadmap to agriculture through the 4-H Club that will have in one space the information for young people of how they can get into agriculture, how they can get land, how they can get financing. So contact the 4-H Club, but yes, there is a policy to reserve land across the agri-parks and across all land held by the Ministry of Agriculture for our young people. Thanks, Minister. Uh, there are a number of questions. They do go on. Um, one uh, question from Dr. Nelson is about um, plans for water um, and irrigation for the Upper Clarendon area. I don't know if you have any um, specific pro projects in that area, Minister. Yeah, so, so we now have, uh, I would say, three major irrigation programs. Um, one is the Essex Valley Agricultural Development Project, which is in South Manchester, South St. Elizabeth, places like Alligator Pond, Exton, um, that is underground, that is underway, and um, we're doing at least five wells and developing a brand new irrigation network that will tremendously change irrigation um, agriculture in South Manchester, South St. Elizabeth. We have a project called the Southern Plains Agricultural Development Project which is to focus on areas of Clarendon and St. Catherine. It really focuses on salt. So clearly in any agricultural development, we have to look at where we have the biggest base of arable land. And what we find is that there's a lot of arable land, former sugar lands in salt Clarendon, salt St. Catherine, um, that need water. So we have a project, it is funded, it is on the way to bring water into areas of South Clarendon and St. Catherine. Clearly the one that I'm most excited about, um, and um, clearly I have a bias because I have a natural connection to it, is the Pija Plains Irrigation Scheme. Um, that irrigation scheme would serve our largest area of farmers. So right now, the farmers in South St. Elizabeth, places like Flagamon, Beacon, um, Newcomb Valley, all the way back to Top Hill, some of our most productive farmers, communities that have the most registered farmers in the country, um, farm without water. And they produce the majority of our melons, cantaloupes, honeydew, um, and they do it really well, unfortunately, but without water at high cost, which leads to significant loss. We did through the ministry and a partnership with the French government, we did a feasibility study all of last year, looking at the possibility of bringing water from the Black River to serve the entire Southern Plains of St. Elizabeth all the way up to Top Hill. The good news is that it is feasible. Um, the Black River does have enough water supply. Um, the good news is that it can be done from an engineering perspective. And we have done a full scale design of what the system would look like we have um, good engineering partners. Um, and um, the other good news is that it would completely be a great return on investment. It would cut, reduce the take up of the underground water supply. And additionally, we'd see farmers having a minimum, a 30% increase in production. It would be game changing. Um, it does cost a lot of money. Uh, I think uh, final costing was about 
280 million United States dollars. The plan is to do it in phases. So our hope now, and clearly we've had a little setback with COVID, but is we're out actively in the field trying to get the resources to undertake that process, which would really significantly expand our irrigation network and change the lives of Jamaica full stop. Fantastic. Uh, Minister, there are a number of questions. I'm gonna take one that's general about financing, access to long-term loans for farmers, specifically aimed at purchasing solar panels and alternative sources of energy, because obviously energy is a significant issue for farmers as well. Yeah, so I, I tried to keep my answer shorter. Um, yes, so there are access to long-term loans. Um, the DBJ is a good go-to for that. Um, the DBJ does online to also um, approve financial institutions. They do have projects that specifically target energy, right? Um, and they have, there has been funds from the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology. And there's a good program through the US Embassy in relation to energy and in relation to farming. So I would say to that uh, person who have asked that question, contact the DBJ, um, contact the Ministry of Science, Energy and Technology both should be able to provide assistance in relation to loans, um, especially targeted to the energy sector. Okay, um, and there's a question about where can people access the National Agribusiness Strategy, which hasn't really been published yet. I think you're in the process of shepherding that through the government. Instead. Yes, so the, the, the National Agribusiness Strategy is not yet published, um, but it has gone through all our internal ministry approvals. So as these things go, we have started acting upon it because again, there is another process that it has to go through to be approved by cabinet. It has already been submitted to, come to cabinet. We've already gotten some comments from cabinet that we are revising um, and we expect to have that back before cabinet in very short order and then to have it tabled in parliament. Once it is tabled in parliament, then we will make it a public document, um, but I'm very sure Jampro is willing to share aspects of it while not sharing the complete document. So if you reach out to Jampro directly, they can share where, what we have thus far. All right, I just want to explain to the audience, I'm taking questions for the minister because he needs to leave shortly. There are several questions which are better directed to Jampro and we'll address those later. Um, there is a question about Pradia Lassne, Minister. You know, there always would be one. Yeah. So what is being done? Yeah, so Pradia Lassne is, 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 is one of the grave challenges um, to agriculture in general. Um, I would say if you were to ask me what, are, what, what is one of our priority focuses this year in relation to agriculture, it would be to strengthen our Pradia Lassne unit. We've already started that. So we brought in a new um, senior superintendent. In fact, I think, yeah, no, he's an assistant commissioner. Um, that we brought in to head up our predator last the unit. That was important because we have to have the alignment between the police force and um, the Ministry of Industry, Commerce and Agriculture. For a long time, we felt like um, predator last was not getting enough focus from police because ultimately it is a policing function. So we have brought in that and now we're in the process of strengthening the unit. We have brought in additional um, district constables to work with the Predator Lasty unit. We have strengthened the unit through the provision of five motor vehicles. In fact, we plan to provide 14, but five have, have already been provided. They have already been dispatched to the areas that we have the highest agricultural production and also the highest incidence of Predator Lasty. So parts of St. Catherine, parts of Clarendon, parts of St. Elizabeth have already gotten a new motor vehicle. So for the period and last unit, I have already got additional personnel support. So what we plan to do for this year is to strengthen personnel, um, strengthen the motor vehicle capacity, and also to reintroduce a system of agricultural wardens, which are persons who will be so trained there under the Agricultural Act. They do have powers of arrest and they operate like district constables, but their focus is directly on agriculture. We will train a number of them across various agricultural belts to add additional support, additional eyes to the police and to the Prado Alaska Youth. So that's what we're doing um, in a nutshell. Thanks very much, Minister. Um, I think maybe we can take one final question for you, which is, um, well, there's, there, there's one from, um, I think, someone in the diaspora. 
how can we help um, foreign owners of land, i.e. people living in the diaspora, to get their land into production? I'm paraphrasing. Oh, great question. You know, um, we, we have a program now under the Agri-Investment Corporation where we're asking people who have agricultural land and agricultural land that they're interested in leasing to let us know. Contact the Agri-Investment Corporation. We will take that hassle from you. We will do the process of leasing that land to put it into agriculture process, um, agriculture production for you. So if you're interested, if you have agricultural land, um, it's not making any resources, you want to do something with it, you are willing to lease it to a farmer who is willing to put it into production, the AIC can do that for you. If you're looking now for partnership or to you to directly invest in that land and you need some handholding services, Jamper can help in that regard. And Jamper can work with RADA to see if they can pair you with any investor that may be interested in investing, but they don't have the land, see what we can bring the 12 of you together so that we can start some production going. So one, if you're invested in leasing that land and you don't want to go through the hassle, you can contact the Agri-Investment Corporation. You can find them on, uh, the internet, you can just type in Agro Investment Corporation. They're on all social media platforms. They can help you through that process. If you're looking to put your land up for somebody to invest in, then talk to Jamper. Yes, Minister, I fully endorse that. We have actually asked, also done a, um, a program to ask people to inform us about land that they have available. Minister, there are a number of other questions. So I will and run, I and if I, if I can come back, then I will come back. Yeah, thanks so much for your time, Minister. No Deeply appreciated, and I'm sure everyone has appreciated your frankness and your forthrightness in answering their questions. So thanks no very problem. much. Thank you. All right. So we're going to move on on our program, ladies and gentlemen. Release Minister for a short while until he's able to rejoin us, and hopefully he will be able to. So we are gonna move ahead now, and I'm gonna ask Marlene Porter, who is head of Jampro's Agribusiness Division, to share with us her thoughts, um, as we said, focusing on investment opportunities, uh, particularly with roots and tubers, rhizomes, and orchard crops. So Marlene, over to you. Thank you, President Edwards. Honorable Minister Green, Minister of Industry Commerce, Agriculture and Fisheries, fellow panelists, Vice President Norman Nair, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a pleasure to share with you on the opportunities, at least some of the opportunities in the agribusiness space. Diane and Minister Green has already shared on the agribusiness landscape in Jamaica, so I'll not repeat those and just move directly into the presentation. I'm now going to share my screen with you. I trust you're all able to see the screen now. So that um, as it is, we have really come a far way as a country in terms of what we, our agriculture sector, we were at a stage where sugar and banana were the only crops that we were, some of the few crops that we had. Now we have over two dozen crops that we know we have strong opportunities in. Um, for today's presentation, of course, we are, have limited time, so we will be focusing on some specific areas. Um, a number of the produce that we are discussing today are suitable, are, have opportunities in the export market as well as on the domestic market because we do have strong demand from our local population as well as our over 4 million tourists that visit our country. Sorry. The screen. Um, um, just give me one moment, please. They, they, we're trying to get the screen to show properly.
All right, so we just want to just kick off, of course, by confirming that Jamaica is a good place to establish your agribusiness venture. Over 40% of our land area is classified as good arable land for agriculture. And right now we are probably around 15% utilizing utilizing the land for um, cultivating agricultural crops so the opportunity remains significant there our climate of course and our soil are excellent i don't know if how many of you have tasted the produce that comes from our soil and our climate but i can assure you that it has a special and a different kind of taste uh, we are strategically located in the Americas, and this, of course, allows us access to some key markets of the U.S. or key markets, the United Kingdom, Canada, CARICOM, and even some of our um, Latin American markets. We also boast a very supportive investment climate, and this is, of course, reflected in, in a number of the global ranking scores that we have um, received from, for example, the, the the World Bank and from um, Forbes and other rating agencies. The categories of crops that we're looking at today are roots and tubers, and we're going to be focusing on yams and sweet potato, rhizomes, we're looking at ginger and turmeric, and for the orchard crops, we're focused on mangoes. We are, now we'll not be able to cover all of our opportunity areas because of, of course, our time limit but you can reach out to us at JAMPRO and we will answer any other questions on these areas as well as other areas of interest that you may have. Um, the, just to let you know as well that we do also have opportunity profiles on these crop areas as well as others which will give you even deeper information for you to be able to get a better understanding of this sector, of the sector opportunities. Let's start off by looking at yam. The yam or major focus areas for Jamaica are yellow yam and white yam, the round leaf yam for the yellow yam and black wisp, and of course for white yam, the negro yam and the sweet yam. Yam is an important staple for Jamaica and is important to the food and nutrition security of our country. We have seen um, greater trend globally towards healthy living and Diane would have spoken to that a little bit and we're seeing rising demand coming out of this we're seeing rising demand for roots and tubers of this kind in particular yam not just within the diaspora group now but we're seeing that kind of that inroads being made into non-diaspora markets in terms of the demand. The our yellow yam command a premium price. Our, our yams generally com, um, command a premium price and um, of course especially in the in the United Kingdom. If you take a look with me at the world import for yam, right now we have over 140,000 tons of yams that are imported across the globe worldwide valued at over 172 million dollars. The US, as you can see from the bar chart to the left, is the largest import of yam and they account for over 50%, followed by Canada, which is also quite sizable, and the UK is featuring there as well. These are three of our major markets, so the fact that yam is doing well in these space, these markets represent an even greater opportunity for us as a country to take advantage of the yam opportunities there. And to the right hand side, if you look at it, you will notice that when we looked at the value um, percentage that the US and the UK are actually very strong as well. In terms of the exports of yam, this is really looking at who are those major exporting countries for yams and Ghana is way above everybody else, uh, running fast away from the rest of us, but Jamaica is there. We're featured right here as, uh, as it, well, we're in third place here. And this is an opportunity for us though, because we are near to many of the markets as you saw from the previous slide that are demanding yam. This of course is an opportunity for us to look at, um, at yam production. 
we have received um, reports about the, the way our yams are popular and are viewed in the marketplace. Um, we have seen because of that other yams from other countries are being labeled as as our jamaican yam so we are we need to take advantage of this one distributor that um the euro monitor did a study for uh for jampro recently a market demand study and coming out of it yam came out as one of the strong um opportunity areas and one of the distributors actually say that jamaican yam is just super popular just to quote um, that particular uh, response uh, from the previous slide you would have noticed that um, the the based on the markets that we saw the importing markets we do in fact have the opportunity to do much do much more in terms of our yam we certainly can move from our third place position in terms of production this is really just showing us over the last um over the last five-year period what has been happening and you can see here that ghana has in fact done you see a huge spike for ghana there the us is going up we're kind of flat here um brazil who is in our region is doing is actually seeing growth as well so we need to seize on this opportunity since our yams are super popular. Let's see how we can seize the opportunities to invest more in this space. And so here this shows really who now are our major trading partners. We have the US, Canada and the UK and um, both in terms of the volumes and value of imports. This production graph is really showing us that um, we have over a sizable amount of production. But when you look at the export data and the import data, you didn't see much happening there. What is happening is that a lot of our yam production is consumed locally so that it gives us the opportunity to come in and actually do more so that we can satisfy a bigger share of the export market itself. I'm going to move on to sweet potatoes. Uh, this sweet potato is the third most widely grown root crop right here in Jamaica, just after yam and cassava. Cassava is doing quite well as well. Sweet potato is a superfood, highly valued superfood, and it is consumed domestically and it, there is wide demand for, for sweet potato in the global market space. Sweet potato is in fact one of seven foods with global annual, annual production of over 100 million metric tons, which gives you some sort of sense as to how much the opportunity is there for sweet potato. If you take a look at the imports of sweet, sweet potato here, the Netherlands is a big importer. I just want you to note though that the Netherlands also is a big trader in, in, yellow, in the um, sweet potatoes so that we can actually look to supplying them as well as the other markets that are actual users like the UK um, to get our, our sweet potatoes into the market. One of the things that the Euro Monitor study also showed us was that sweet potatoes and yam can be can be marketed together and since we have had such a success with our yams in this in the global market space here is an opportunity for us to see how we can piggyback with our sweet potatoes in order to get the get move quickly through the channels that are established already as you can see the world volume of um sweet potatoes imported is not insignificant at $700 million and the value of it is at it, the, well, uh, the figure here is more like 850 million tons that we're seeing. From the export side, the US and the Netherlands are big players in this space. Uh, together, these two markets alone account for close to 60% of the exports. If you noticed on the import side, the US didn't feature there because they are a major grower for, of sweet potatoes as well. And so here we have 
yet they're still a big um, and they still have to export into other markets. We can also look to see how we can actually use the piggybacking suggestion to see how we can get a bigger cut of this global market space. Here is a, a line graph again, which shows how sweet potato has been moving over the last three, the last five years. And you can see, of course, that the Netherlands, most of them are going up with the exception, of course, of Vietnam, which is showing a decline there. The, our major trading partners for sweet potatoes represent, or, or continue to be our major, um, our major traditional markets, which would be the United States, Canada, and the, and the United Kingdom. The Cayman Islands is also a big buyer and St. Martin as well. We could not do this um, presentation on roots and tubers without talking a little bit about value added products. There are uh, value added products that we can get from both yam and sweet potatoes, which are doing quite well, very much in demand in the global market space. And some of these are here on the screen. Um, we are already doing some of these, but there is still demand coming to us through our distributors for these products as well. Within the roots and tubers category, these are on the screen, you're seeing some of the other opportunity areas for root, uh, roots and tubers. Irish potato, certainly we have done a lot in this space and we are now satisfying a substantial share of our local demand for Irish potato and we still have great opportunities there. Uh, likewise for cassava, dasheen and the other root and tuber crops. I want to move on to ginger. Um, the ginger itself is one of those, co those crops that we produce here in Jamaica that is really very popular. It's, our ginger is well renowned in the global market space, um, usually for the, um, the flavor and the pungency of our ginger and also the oil content of the ginger. It is particularly demanded in the specialty food markets and, um, and those manufacturing entities that seek to extract the oil and the flavors from the ginger. The main varieties that are grown in Jamaica are the yellow and blue ginger. What we have seen in recent years is that our ginger has suffered from the rhizome rot pod disease. Um, but a lot has been done by the, the government and of course we're partnering now under a major project with the, uh, with the FAO, the Food Agricultural Organization, on a major ginger project. And this, in, under this project, it is developing a more integrated production model which moves along the full value chain in terms of the development of ginger. But it also here involves the use of tissue culture technology which would enable the propagation of disease-free materials for ginger. So there is a significant, um, we, significant outlook that we see for ginger. And so we are encouraging our, um, our investors to take a look at ginger as well as an, uh, for, for an opportunity area. In terms of the world imports, we are seeing here that the, our nearshore market again, the US, our major traditional market, is importing a lot of ginger here. So we, this too represents an opportunity that we can look at further. Um, in terms of the exporting nations, China is way above everybody else. I remember the, the, um, back before the hit of the rhizome rot, rot pod disease, how much ginger we used to do. And we need to get back there because we're, we're getting the demand for it. And so we just need to get our production up so that we can take advantage of that as well. From sorry so these are now for the ginger that we now have and i did explain that we are low now on the ginger but there are the opportunities with the new approach that we're taking to ginger there's still opportunity and our markets are within the region as well as the united states turmeric is related to the ginger 
to a ginger, of course, it belongs to the ginger family. And um, we do have a number of varieties of, of, of turmeric. Um, a number of species of turmeric. It is said that um, turmeric cures almost everything. So you understand, you can understand that the demand in recent times has really skyrocketed for, for turmeric. It, I mean, we can talk about some of the things that we know ginger cures, abdominal pains, digestive di disorders, right, right down to conjunctivitis. So it's a, it's a whole range of um, health benefits that we have heard um, that's derivable from, um, from turmeric. So in terms of the demand itself, India is our, the importing countries. India is the largest importing country right now. And they're also the largest exporting country, uh, as you'll see on the next slide. What is very interesting uh, is that while we do have the production of ginger like sweet potato, um, the, we do have the production, large production taking place, but the proportion that gets into the export market is really quite small. For sweet potato is somewhere between one to 2% now, and here for turmeric, it's around 3%. So if what it means is that there are markets that are needing the turmeric, which would not necessarily have the conditions that are suitable for the growing of turmeric that we could be looking to satisfy at this time. In terms of the export, I mentioned earlier on that um, the, India is a major player there, 73% of the market that they have. And um, Jamaica, for us, we only had about um, point, less than 1%. Uh, a report from the International Trade Center, though, in looking at all the market potential, the untapped market potential for turmeric, they estimated that it, is, it stands at about 185 million US dollars. So, and Jamaica itself was identified as one of those market areas that we can actually take advantage of this huge opportunity that's there. And of course, some of the, the major markets that were suggested that we could target here are the Netherlands again, and, and um, the United States and the United Kingdom. The major trading partners for turmeric are the US, which we can grow, and Canada, which we can grow as well in, um, in this area. For the value added products as well, ginger, and turmeric, we have a number of value-added products for both both products. Uh, the ginger oil itself is very popular, and we see both product, both of these crops being used in more and more in non-food areas, in medicines, in perfumes, in body scrubs, skincare products. So these are not just the, even though we're the persons when they hear agriculture tend to think food primarily it, there are opportunities for all of these products even for our potatoes in terms of how we can use it in the fuel space so there are opportunities outside of food for many of our um our local crops other rhizomes that we could consider are asparagus. We had a good look at it in recent times. Bamboo, a substantial development is taking place in our bamboo space. And lotus, which of course, you know, you, those of you who are accustomed to popcorns would enjoy something like a, a lotus. So this too represents an opportunity for Jamaica. Finally, we are going to talk a little bit about orchard crops. Um, in, the, in this particular area, we know that mango is a really high demand product um, right across the, the, the world. In, the, in North America, in Europe, in the Middle East, we are seeing strong demand for these, for mangoes. Mango is considered as a super fruit again with you, so many health benefits that um, health benefits that cut across so many different areas as well. It is a long-term crop though, and we need to bear that in mind. You usually can begin to reap your mangoes or, or benefit from it some three to seven years down the, the road. So intercropping is really key when we're thinking about doing, um, doing tree crops, orchard crops like mango. 
And intercropping for mango in particular can be done with potatoes and a range of vegetables. And I'm sure there are many others that we could discuss if we have some conversation. And I'm saying if we discuss because I'm looking forward to those conversations, the demand, we have been seeing a substantial demand for mangoes in the, in, in the US, which we just recently started to, we started to ship back to again, now that we're able to um, under, use the irradiation process in that market. Uh, one of our buyers ac actually shared with us videos of persons lining up for hours before the stores are opened to get just uh, one of our, some of our mangoes that we're shipping out of Jamaica into the US market. The market is there for the UK as well. We have actually had a voluntary stop on the shipment of mangoes to the UK at this time. We're looking now to grow out our crops so that we can see investments coming in into, the, into having water, a water treatment, hot water treatment facility so that we can deal, take the mangoes through that process because you all know that um, fruit, fly, fruit fly disease is a problem that affects mangoes. And so the irradiation process and the hot water treatment process both help to clear these, this problem. And so we're looking to see investments taking place in orchard crops, in the mango or as an orchard crop itself, and also in a hot water treatment facility for mangoes. I, I must mention the, the, um, our main mangoes are East Indian, St. Julian, and, and the Tommy Atkin mangoes. There are other mangoes that especially our diaspora people love, um, but just to say that these are the main ones that we're now exporting to the US and Canada is also a substantial market for our, our ginger. Who are the importing countries for mangoes? The US is right there. We're just starting back. We need more mango orchards so that we can do much more with the US um, going forward. Uh, in terms of the export, major exporting countries, it's not that Mexico doesn't have anything, but the data itself was not um, quite clear. So, but they are a major exporting market as well. And um, likewise, or, or other neighbors here, Costa Rica and Peru are also big mango producers, uh, big mango exporters. One of the interesting things about mangoes, you know, is that um, even though it is grown in several countries and in large quantities, many times you find that it is utilized for your local production because the local demand tend to also be high for mangoes as it is here in Jamaica. So we're really looking to see how we can get more orchards going so that we can meet more of the export markets. And again, this is the growth, what the growth in mango is looking like right now um, for some of the markets. We're seeing Thailand, um, um, Hiking there, we want to see on the on this chart here, Jamaica coming up in that space. Other tree crops, it's not just about mangoes. We only have time to talk about mangoes, but cocoa, papayas, coconut, aki, avocado are strong opportunity areas as well. And we welcome the discussions with you. We have um, we we welcome the discussions with you on any of these crop areas and others that you may have that are not um, mentioned here. The minister had spoken to the areas that the government is focused on and some of these are here on the screen for you. Please do reach out to us and let us help you to understand more about how you can invest in this space and how to, to find the lands, how to maneuver the local space to get your investments up and going and to also get you into markets. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Marlene, for that excellent presentation. I have to say thanks to the agribusiness team in Jampro because they really are one of our most vibrant team and they really love what they do. And you can see the love and the TLC that went into that presentation. Now um, we need to move on with the program to the investor panel discussion. And unfortunately, I'm going to have to leave you. So I'm going to turn over to Norman 
and ask Norman um, to introduce the members of the panel and then to moderate that panel. You're all asking such great questions, which is brilliant. And so it's clear that um, our audience is really passionate about this subject and you have a lot of questions. So what I will promise you from the Jampro point of view is that if there are any questions that we don't get to today, if you leave us your contact details, we will be happy to get answers for you because we don't want one question to be left unanswered in this session. We need to answer all your questions. And a lot of those questions you're asking, Jampro can actually help you with, such as access to um, sugar company holdings and land there. So we're all here to help. You have a strong Jampro team. I'm leaving you in good hands, um, but I'm gonna sign off now and ask Norman to pick up the baton. All right, thank you, President. Diane Edwards. At uh, this time, I just want to introduce the, the panelists for our panel discussion. Um, Mr. Ricky Waits of the Value Fruit Company Limited, uh, Growers of Papaya. Mr. Matthew Lynn from Imagination Farms, CB Group Operation of Imaginary Farms, Growers of Soil, Onion, Sweet Corn, among many other things. Uh, Mr. Roger Turner of Toller Estates, grow of cocoa, um, bananas, etc. Gentlemen, thanks, thanks for taking time to, to be here uh, and sharing your insights with us. Uh, Minister, share an uh, optimistic view of, of agriculture and indeed agribusiness um, for us going forward. I just want to get uh, a sense, uh, just kicking off uh, from each of you, um, your perspective, the opportunities that you're, you're seeing uh, in this agribusiness, uh, what are some of the changes required to facilitate uh, taking advantage of those opportunities um, as you see? And so I, I just open up the panel for, for that exchange between us. Um, if I could just ask um, Ricky, uh, just because your name uh, comes up first. Uh, Ricky, if you could just kick us off uh, with, with some of those thoughts. Okay, morning. We've been um, growing and producing. Growing and producing for um, 34 years. Yes. Um, and exporting them primarily to North America and the UK and mainland Europe. Um, challenges sort of, of um, we've seen over these years have pretty much been the same. Um, the inability to really cheap long-term finance, the cost of energy for irrigation, the uh, the last the theft, crop theft business, and research and development. So the minister had talked about them putting into place some new initiatives for research and development and the ability to get good land. We found that the markets overseas have become challenging in the fact that they are wanting very strict food safety protocols with global gap, et cetera. Logistics have become an issue um, because the aircraft industry have downsized airplanes coming from North America to be more efficient and they can't carry cargo. And, um, and shipping uh, states is not very competitive. So, we are looking from our own selves more to the local market, which is becoming better and better over the years. So it's demanding almost what the export markets want. And so we are shifting our roles and, and, and utilizing the potentials in the local market. Okay. Um, <laughs> Production, agriculture is all about production per acre, production per hectare, whatever. And the, 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 the number one challenge is there's a lack of good research and development backup. So 
R&D, if you take a look at Bodles and what is spent at Bodles, Bodles, fantastic research station. It's now underfunded. And if you wanted as a farmer to plant 50 acres of jackfruit, for instance, you'd have to produce your own jackfruit. Um, there's no commercial nurseries that cater for this. So it's, it's those sort of things, research and development in these target crops um, and the ability to be able to get planting material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So listen, thanks, thanks, thanks for that opening, um, Ricky. And and I mean, clearly uh, a number of challenges that that you have you have identified. And and I know it's it's common. You know, um, some of those challenges are, are common across the um, the other panelists as well. Um, what I want, uh, if, if we could do, certainly for the other um, panelists, if we could get a sense as to, you know, what are some of the, the successes that we are seeing despite, despite um, the, you know, ton of challenges that we are very much aware that we're, we're having, what are the successes that we're seeing um, in your neck of the woods around Predia Lassery financing, if, if that's the case. Um, and, and even in, in, in instances around water supply, uh, I, I know that there have been, you know, successes. Uh, so to the extent that you could share, we uh, would appreciate it. Matthew, you want to share with us some, some insights? Yeah, sure. Um, good evening, everybody. All right. I, let me take it from a little different perspective, Norman, and, and hope that I'll get to your answer. Yes. Um, Unlike, you know, Ricky and Roger, who have been on the, I would say, the crop side for a very long time, crops are fairly new to, to us and our group. Our background is, is really livestock and, and mostly chicken. Um, and chicken, as I think most people would agree in Jamaica, has been a fairly um, successful industry. Um, and it, it has allowed, you know, as a, as a base, it's allowed us in the CB group to move into other things like pork. Um, like eggs, um, and then on the feed side, we've moved into to genetics. You know, Ricky talked about plant genetics. Um, you know, we've gone very big into the animal genetic side um, and supplying the farmers with the different things that they, they need to be successful. And, you know, I think from an opportunity perspective, what we saw a few years back is um, the opportunity with crops, right? So if you think about Jamaica in context, right, the, 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 the you know, what makes us special and, and, um, and, and you, know, you know, popular in the world is, of course, our culture, but our environment. Uh, and, and, and for the most part, the same reasons the environment are very good for tourism is the same reasons why the environment is very good for agriculture. Um, we also saw the, 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 the opportunity with the imports, right? So, um, you know, Marlene had a fantastic presentation, um, very well done. And she looked a lot on the export potential of, of crops. But, you know, we looked at the other side as well, which was what were we importing as a country? And then what could we substitute for import? So we, we, we looked at it both ways. And we, we thought the, the priority wise, we would look at the import side. Um, and of course, there's available land, there's available labor. And, uh, you know, I think it, what it really requires is structure. Right. Um, so your question to, to Ricky was, you know, what's the opportunity, but what's the challenge? And to me, the, cha the biggest challenge with Jamaican agriculture is the structure of the industries. Um, I think too many farmers try to do too much instead of specializing in different aspects of farming. You know, somebody specializing in genetics, somebody specializing in the growing, somebody specializing in the distribution. Um, you know, it's a the, it's the Ford concept. Um, so I, I think um, what we've seen um, in, the, in the last couple of years, in, in, you know, and I, I'm going to speak for myself here and our company, um, the success we've seen is in being able to structure um, some of these, these industries that, that, that specialize in, in certain crops. Um, and allowing different people to participate, um, we, we share, of course, um, our, our knowledge wherever we find it. Um, we bring together the right um, teams of experts. And I think we also, you know, share the risks and the rewards. So what we've, what we've been able to do is develop contract farming systems for a few different crops that, that we're concentrating on. Um, the big ones being onions, right? 
um, up, up until recently, Marlene, you probably know better than I, um, you know, some 80 odd percent of onions are imported into Jamaica annually, right? So, you know, you're talking about something that, that if you grow it, you know, all, almost automatically you should be able to sell it. Um, so onions, um, peppers, of course, we love our, our, our scotch bonnet pepper. Um, and, 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 and to think that so many of our processors can't get enough peppers um, to export, it's, it's, a, it's a limiting factor for them. Um, so onions, peppers, sweet corn, and sorrel, those have been our, our, our big crops that we've focused on. We haven't tried to go too wide. You know, my eyes, you know, I, I get tempted to see all the, the, the opportunities, the, the tubers and the roots. There's so many opportunities there, but if you try to concentrate on too many, I, I think that's where you, you fail. So we've, we've stuck to um, those four crops and we've looked to structure the way in which we grow it and which we, we share the risk and rewards. Um, and I think if you looked on it on a, on a um, you know, national level, what you'd see is increased production um, of all of those items and reduction in imports. All right. Thanks, 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 Matthew, for, for that feedback, um, highlighting some of our um, the positive attributes, if you will. Um, you know, certainly in climate, um, not just for tourism, the microclimate that we offer uh, energizes those products, I mean, those plant products in a way that create the unique flavors that, that we have and make uh, Jamaica products, you know, so attractive um, for others around the world. Indeed, land and labor, we have land and, and labor we do have. And, and, you know, the focus on structure around, you know, enabling the success of that is, is certainly the way you see forward. Um, one of the things that the minister uh, spoke about in brief was the agribusiness strategy, um, you know, agribusiness strategy that has been put together. And, and we hope through that, and I'll, I'll just say a few things about that um, when we wrap up. Uh, we hope through that to create the kind of structure that's required for the business going forward as we move from agriculture to agribusiness. And, and there is a, a more than just a terminology, there is a, a transformation that, that takes place uh, as part of that effort. Um, but Roger, I want to turn to you um, now, you know, just, just so from your perspective, you're also into crops. Um, you know, what have been some of the successes that you, you're, you're seeing and, and some of the guiding um, you know, ways that we could uh, look to uh, incorporate some of the things um, that need to be done going forward um, from, from your perspective. Roger? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. The number one factor for crop selection that we've stuck with over the years is taste. Taste Jamaica, eat Jamaica fresh, have uh, been campaigns that have been put forward. And we've held on to that one assiduously over the years. So in most of the crops in Jamaica are terroir in its multiple forms around the island, produce some of the most amazing tasting fruits and vegetables. Our ginger is a prime example. Our mangoes, you can't taste a mango better than a mango grown in Jamaica. And even the Bombay mango that we enjoy in Kingston came from India. And when Indians come and eat the Bombay, the Sumi mango, it was called the Sumi mango in Delhi, they find it bigger, fatter, and better. So mangoes are a great crop. Uh, we can't grow them in Bogwalk where I live. So we picked um, avocados, jackfruit, longans, and cocoa. And uh, the cocoa is cementing itself as a crop for us in a commercial uh, way, um, a much improved set of genetics and husbandry protocols that have been shared with seven ministers of agriculture, uh, allow us to get the productivity uh, that we require as business farmers. And we have been sending our beans to several chocolatiers inside and outside Jamaica, and we have achieved very fine chocolate. 
Um, we're looking not to compete with the HASPA, which is a standard for so many markets and producers in Chile and Ecuador and Peru produce a HASPA to send to America in the off season for the American crop. We feel the Simmons pair is uh, as valuable and gives the consumer a choice between a small nutty pair in the Haas and a large, succulent, superbly flavored Simmons type pair. And so we have a couple of varieties that we're trying with at the moment. Um, jackfruit is a good wet weather crop and the health benefits and the productivity are fantastic. And at the Orange River Research Station, they have my one and golden pillow and green gold and all the varieties from around the world. So there's great opportunity to grow jackfruit. Um, in all of this, the Participants today must recognize that they've got to do a lot of the field work themselves. You've got to work it out. You've got to work hard. Everything is not going to be given to you on a plate. Ricky's testament to that. Look how he survived so many trials and tribulations with his poor course, and he's still the number one poor poor farmer in, in Jamaica and doing an amazing job. And you have to work really diligently for a long time. The genetics are mostly here. The support from the pesticides, and we need a range of pesticides. I know it's not a word that is going to be welcomed by many of our participants who are all looking for um, organic and pesticide free. Yeah. As a commercial farmer, there are a select number of crops that can be in that category. But if you want to be like Matthew and Ricky and I, you've got to hug it up and make it the best as you can. And be very conscious of how you use them. And we would like to see the range of pesticides that are available in Jamaica broadened, because that is a huge limiting factor. Okay. Um, but You've got to focus on taste. At the end of the day, nothing else matters. Matthew's corn tastes brilliant. If it didn't, he wouldn't sell it. Um, and it's the same for whether you're going to go into ackies, mangoes, pawpaws, jackfruit. They've all got fantastic opportunities. And the terroir Jamaica makes us have the best flavored fruits and vegetables in the world. Thank you. All right, thanks, thanks, Roger. I mean, um, the, that, that taste you, to which you refer, a uh, combination of our soil and unique microclimate that we experience and, and all the other um, you know, scientific factors that go into to make us uh, the unique offering for our, our farm produce um, that give us that number one taste. Um, so you, you you mentioned you know um, the the you know even in case of Ricky that that he has gone through a number of challenges and and clearly um, still continue to be one of the bigger biggest player in the industry certainly in the area is area of produce. Um, we can't have this discussion without mention the word COVID. And so whilst we talk about all that we have, have gone through, the successes, et cetera, um, we recognize that, that COVID play a, a, a key role in terms of changing the dynamics uh, around the opportunities as we see it. And I, I just want to ask, you know, just, just from each of your perspective, what has endured to, to your success? Um, or, you know, what is it that you're doing differently to allow you to, um, you know, move through this period. So, you know, others, um, other participants, um, you know, can get some insights as to the, what we can do differently to enable us um, to, to go through this, um, this period uh, through which we have been exposed to, to COVID. Um, Ricky, I don't know if you want to pick that up again. 
Yeah, sure. Um, in in, in our, our biggest um, section of our market um, assessment was export. We did about 80% export and 10, 20% local. It shifted completely. Um, what COVID did was directly impacted our hotel markets. Um, luckily, it only um, added up to about 25 to 30% of our local distribution. And we found that there was a lot of on, the, on social media about the necessity to consume a lot of crops or fruit that are high in vitamin C. Um, is very high in vitamin C, and so that helped. Um, we've been fortunate enough that we've been able to get some exports out through uh, cargo charter flights that are coming into both Montego Bay and Kingston. So although they, the commercial airlines have stopped, we can't get to Europe at the moment, but we are able to get some of our produce to the US. Um, so it has had an impact. Um, uh, we, we have shuffled around our distribution locally and um, it, it, it's, although hard, it's, it's achieved, you know, we're able to stay operational and, um, and get rid of all our fruit, which yeah. is the most important thing. But, um, we're lucky that not, we don't have many competitors locally in production, so you just need two fellas to stop growing and all of a sudden there's a massive opening. Um, yeah. so, and farming is all about social distancing anyway. So from an operational standpoint, all, most of the farm workers on the, in the fuel are far enough apart that they are safe. In our pack house, the Ministry of Health have come in and done audits on us. So our packers, we are lucky that we have a large packing house so we can space them out accordingly. And our customers are cognizant of the requirements when they come. And so we're, it's, it's a new way. Um, and I'm sure it's gonna go on for quite a long time. And that's why I said the first time that the, the replacement of imports, um, I think our primary, um, I think Matthew said that as well, where, where we grow and develop our local markets. Um, I see that's where, and maybe Caracom as well. The big issue with export right now is logistics, is getting the products out and in a competitive fashion and safe. And so, so it's definitely inwardly we're looking now. And it's something that we probably should have done many, many years ago. Yeah, it's like that technology transformation. Uh, we have been forced into it um, by virtue of, of COVID, working remotely, etc. cetera. Um, but you're right, this has created opportunities for us in a, in a new way um, that we, we might have not given, you know, full thought. And, and you know, clearly um, that, that's good for us. Um, Matthew, from your perspective, um, any, you know, what, how this COVID, you know, uh, yeah, you know, has uh, impacted you in a way that, yeah, yeah. I, I, let, let me not talk about impacted us so far, but if if there's something to learn about agriculture and COVID, um, is that agriculture or agribusiness is is not farming, all right? Agribusiness is farming and growing and selling. Um, and agriculture, in, in, and when you have a situation like this, what you see is very, that, that, that timing is a very important factor. Um, regardless of what happens on the, 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 the market side, on the sell side, the production side remains constant, right? You can't stop the trees from growing. You can't stop the chickens or pigs from growing. You have to feed them. You have to, you have to continue to take care of them. Um, but all of that, when you're doing that and you're expending um, monies and, and still paying um, wages and, and all of that, doesn't mean it's going to translate into sales at the end of the day. All right? um, 
and and when you're therefore in a in an industry that that is mostly in a fresh perishable item what it also brings about is is the necessity um, and importance of some sort of structured industry where storage and distribution is um, is available um, and, and I, I don't necessarily mean that you're gonna store something in a chill pro chill chill room but it's can you take that one product and transform it into something else right um, if we were you know if go back to us now if we had a, a huge oversupply of onions for instance could we take that onion and make it into something else uh, an onion mash an onion powder um, onion soup, I, I don't know. Um, I, it, 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 it again shows why structure is, is important. Um, and, and, and when you have such an integrated industry, you either have to have very deep pockets um, to, to be able to, to do all of it, or what you need to do is share the risk and reward with partners and collaborators. Uh, I think COVID brought brought about the the, the 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 awareness on the local market more than anything else of of eating um, fresh, eating local, um, and I think what the what, what Jamaicans were exposed to during COVID times, especially the early days, were um, produce, you know, fruits and vegetables that would normally have gone to the hotels, very good quality stuff. Um, that they would not have normally gotten on the local market. And I think the opportunity now is to see how could you, um, you know, not, you know, grow some of those items, not just for the hotels, but for also the local market. So if, if in the future you have some sort of challenge in one market, you, you've diversified your risk by having, you know, multiple, um, you know, channels that you sell, sell in. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. Roger, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, just to say that COVID-19 has shrunk GDP and put a lot of economies almost into recession. And as Ricky said, logistics have been murdered, airlift logistics for exports. And as Matthew said, markets have shrunk. So um, we have to realign and cut our production, which is what has happened in many, many cases. A lot of people uh, are not producing what they used to. So COVID-19 will take a while to run its course, but in that move, we realize that we've got to be more nimble with our marketing and our how to put production as it were on hold, like the bananas, minimize inputs, reduce yields, stay alive. So that when COVID-19 passes, we can put, put on back the gas pedal and having survived, we're stronger in the local market. So we will hopefully prevent more imports coming in when the tourists come back. And we will be able to satisfy our tourist industry 100% with local produce, other than maybe the top end cuts of beef or fillet and so on and steak, which we can't produce. But everything else should come from Jamaica. And we're hoping that the Ministry of Agriculture will align itself with that move. And the traders of produce who supply the hotel trade will primarily go to the local farmers for all of their lettuce and tomatoes and cucumbers and, and hotel food, as I call it. As Matthew said, we move the hotel food into the local market, it's well accepted. We can move it back into the hotel trade and cut out the imports. And I think that strategy is something that we need to engage in and promote more uh, agriculture as a result after COVID-19. Thank you. All right, thanks, Roger, and, and, and thanks. I'm just going to ask the panel just to, to continue to be with us. We're going to jump into um, a QA and a section now. And um, you know, a, a number of questions, uh, I just want to apologize on behalf of the minister who um, had to, to depart earlier from, from this um, the session. 
a uh, number of questions directed to him. Uh, we promise that uh, we'll capture your questions, uh, ones that I've sent in, and endeavor to answer and provide you a response to those questions. Um, so if, if it's not addressed in this forum, just feel assured that um, we're going to respond to those questions. I think some of them are specifically directed at, at Minister, and um, I would not undertake to answer on his behalf. But one of the things I think we can, um, one of the questions I'm seeing here um, is, is about export market. And I just want to ask uh, Marlene, um, you know, if, if she could just uh, comment on, on what role Jam Pro can and has been playing in facilitating um, exports and identifying, identifying markets for export of our local produce. Marlene? Okay, okay. Um, from our standpoint, when we decide to link buyers and suppliers, local suppliers together, we start off by first of all trying to understand the product and the business of our local um, player because, you know, it's very difficult to match a supplier with a buyer unless we understand what they're capable of doing, what their capacity is and uh, also if we understand their products. So we start there. And then of course, once they meet certain IT, certain um, market requirements, then of course we will, we will discuss with them potential buyers. We will do the business matchmaking, um, facilitate the meetings, and, um, and then the, the conversation continues between the buyer and the supplier. There are some specific things that we do as well. We, we bring in buyers into Jamaica and based on what they're looking for, we would do that connection as well. Some of the buyers come into Jamaica because they want to see for themselves firsthand how the businesses operate to make their own assessment on, the, on how, how the business is doing. Because you have to understand that they cannot start uh, a business with somebody and then shortly after you're hearing that they can't make the supplies for the market because shelf space costs in these markets. So we really have to ensure that that is done. And so when the buyers come in, they too want to make sure of that as well. So we do those linkages. We also do overseas trade shows where we the companies into markets and um, they participate in trade shows whether uh, whether it is ones directed at the um, directed at specialty areas like coffee for example or um, special kind of sauces spices or just general trade shows around food so we do that and we also organize missions that are not linked to any particular shows where we go in and we set up in the markets and we bring in buyers into the space and have the, 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 the exporters meet with them and link with them. Our overseas offices, just finally, our overseas offices also in, the, in North America and Europe, they work very, very closely with us in helping to get information on the market, in helping to find out information on the buyers as best as possible. And then we're able to share that with our local um, suppliers as well. One of the key things, just as a final comment, is that we encourage our suppliers to ensure that they understand food safety requirements and the market requirements because those are critical in how you set up and organize your business from day one you need to understand that these will play an important role going forward well thanks thanks um thanks for that marlene certainly capacity quality consistency in the volume uh both in volume and, and quality play a key role as we look to engage you know um the, the export um, markets that are looking for uh, Jamaican exports. Um, you, you finish off with one of the things that I, I want to just get a perspective. Um, and I, I'm seeing a number of questions alluded to um, that, that area. The standards, the strict standards that we have to uh, adhere um, to for, for exports for the various markets. I mean, clearly, you know, our panelists are, are seasoned players uh, in those markets um, or in the market of, of exports. Um, what, what are some of the uh, things that you'd have encountered and the guidance that you could provide um, some of our participants uh, on this, um, this, this webinar on, on you know, meeting or overcoming 
um, those standards uh, for some of the key markets for which we have uh, continued to do exports. Um, anyone want to jump on that firstly? Any of the panelists, feel free. Um, yeah, we've, we've been supplying mostly market trades in you know, export markets. And from the mid 90s, um, food safety and traceability protocols, PASAP systems um, were voluntary. And we spent a lot of time working with fellow exporters through the Jamaica Exporters Association and JAMPRO and the Minister of Agriculture um, to bring up to speed many of our exporters. Um, a few have, have got these protocols. There is one globally recognized um, food safety and good agri and that's called Global Gap. It's, uh, it started in Europe and many of the developed countries globally have accepted it as a standard. Although there are some markets that have um, enhanced those standards and for their own private labels. An example would be Tesco supermarket in the UK. Um, global gap to most um, is a frightening document and system, but it's the interpretation of its requirements is where you, one needs to be clever. And you don't need, i give you an example. If you have to have field toilets out in the field every 500 meters, you don't need to have a, a concrete structure with tiled floors, walls. You just need to have a clean structure with potable water and soap facilities so that field workers are able to go to the bathroom, wash their hands with potable water, etc. If you read the question in the Global Gap checklist, how you interpret that would frighten many. And many, many smaller farmers don't have the capabilities of getting Global Gap certification. And what is required is that their exporters who buy their produce need to have them as a supplier and the, the, the exporter be the one that drive, like a mother farm technique drive the protocols. These things are getting stricter and stricter. Um, and that is the biggest challenge globally in exporting is the fact that the requirements are, it, it's almost like a check and balance. They, they use it to satisfy their customers' needs for safe, wholesome food. But they also use it as a, as a quantity control mechanism because they know that there are some players who produce stuff who can't do it. So it's a, a balance. In it. And unfortunately, now it's become compulsory. It's not voluntary anymore. So it, it is achievable. And it's something that has to be done if you want to export into the supermarket trade. But I know that the wholesale trade now is also looking at it for food safety and traceability. So that is the challenge. Yeah. 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 Uh, Matthew, what has been your experience? Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'll say two things quickly. Uh, the first is that certification in itself, I strongly yeah. believe. I, I, apart from the, the ability to export, um, the process of going through certification will make you a better business. All right? um, um, secondly, what I would say is <laughs> um, bring in the experts. Uh, we, we tried for many years to, to do our own HACCP plan, ISO plan, whatnot, whatnot. Um, and many years later, we were no further down the road than when we started. Um, we did not get this done until we, we outsourced it. Um, so today we have, we have certifications all over the place, HACCP, ISO, GMP, SQF, GAP. Um, 
it's stuff that I, I, I can't tell you. I personally know a lot about. Uh, but there, there are companies in Jamaica that, um, that, that, that focus here, um, that understand it well. Um, and Imagination Farms, we just got our Global Gap certification maybe two years ago. Um, and we, 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 um, we went to a, a company called Benchmark, um, Bench, Benchmark QMS with Dr. Velton Gooden. Um, and he and the team there, um, superb. Okay, good. Um, thanks for that. And, and then Roger, just, just um, to cap it off, um, you know, I imagine your, your standard is taste. <laughs> of course. Uh, like Matthew and Ricky, we went through Global Gap and Global Gap will make you a better farmer, as Matthew said. And as Ricky said, it is terribly, terribly important to get it right for the marketplace. Um, at the end of the day, the document procedure guides you on how to be a better businessman and a better farmer. You tie in the integrated pest management program that you must have, and you use your pesticides better and less, and use less pesticides. It makes you more environmentally aware and makes and ensures that your uh, footprint in the environment is reduced and enhances your production. Uh, so standards for export standards for the local trade are essential and more so in export you need to apply the importing countries standards whether it's a standard to export into the country or the standard that the buyer has imposed on you. So as the three of us are saying, there are standards that will do us very well and external auditing uh, takes place to maintain that standard. What has happened in Jamaica is that everybody, every government department has hitched a ride on this and is imposing standards on us like the Jamaica Agricultural Commodity Regulatory Authority is starting to impose standards that are not necessary. The only standard that is necessary is what your buyer imposes. And so if this participants in this webinar take anything away from this webinar, it is that we don't want more regulation, more bureaucracy, more red tape in a parochial sense. We want well-applied standards that drive compliance in the marketplace that uplift us. And it is important that Jamaica makes that change away from over-regulation to market-driven requirements. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Roger. I mean, um, you know, Clearly, the, 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 uh, the panelists here are rightly selected, um, representing what we, are, we want to see as pretty much the ideal um, you know, platform for what we are now calling agribusiness as against agriculture. And, and there's a, a whole set of notion associated with the agriculture. But in clearly the standards, the, the level of um, you know, how you all participate in this space uh, is, is something that many of uh, probably participants are, you know, are striving towards. And I, I want to just, just close off this Q&A section just to um, ask you all to comment, you know, yes, clearly you're largely the big guys in this. And, and you know, farming still continue um, with a lot of our, our small farmers. Um, you know, how do you, um, so to speak, bring all these farmers um, up the chain, if you will, um, enable them, um, facilitate or integrate them in what you're doing, uh, development, if you will, uh, so they too can be part of this you know, large, big uh, agribusiness that we're talking about and not just, you know, small farmers along the, the side. 
um, if, if any of you could just, just comment on that, what efforts you know, your organization has been taking to do a lot of integration in developing um, these, these small farmers part of your um, bigger operation? Okay, go off first, Matthew. Uh, I, I, well, I mean, I, I, I shared it earlier in terms of um, what Imagination Farms had been doing um, over the last couple of years and, and transitioning um, our, our production model into a contract farming model, right? Um, and I think that, you know, in the last two years, I think we've added 20 plus uh, farmers who now um, work with us in, in, in producing, right? So, so we ourselves on our own land, we are only producing a portion of what we're actually putting into the market. Um, and that, that drive continues, you know, what we, what we try to do is, is to grow at a pace that we can support them. Um, you know, it's, it's great for a farmer to say, I'm, I'm willing to, to, to farm and I've, and I've been farming, but, but, you know, you know, Ricky said earlier, it's, it's how many kilograms per, per acre or hectare. Um, and at a certain level, you know, you're just too inefficient. So, you know, we see our role as, as partially, you know, supporters and educators and trainers. Um, we try to use technology to make people more efficient, um, education to, to make them better farmers um, so that they can be more competitive. And, uh, you know, we, we scale that way. So, uh, you know, no sense in bringing them onto our system if we can't support them at the same time, because ultimately they, they will fail and we will fail too. Um, so we are continuously looking to grow. Um, to, you know, you know, there's still a lot of imports that are coming in in the, those very same crops that I spoke about, uh, and, and and as Marlene said, there's lots of potential on exports. So we are we are we're willing to to take on more farmers, um, more contracts, um, but but let me also pause and caution. Right, um, we've taken on you know we may be working with twenty odd farmers today. But we've started relationships with, with more than 20. Um, and what has happened, we've seen is in the good times, or let's say in the bad times, maybe that's a better way to look at it, um, the farmers willing to work with us and to sell us on a contract. Um, we're at their farm, we're helping them, we are um, supporting them, and we have a contract. And, and then when the market opportunity comes where they can sell to somebody else or sell into the market at a better price, all of a sudden, the product isn't available anymore, all right? Um, and I'm, 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 I'm sure Roger and Ricky know exactly what I'm talking about, that they've seen it over and over again. Um, if, you, if you want to have overall growth, you have to have, um, you, you know, firm contracts um, and you have to work with the right people. Um, it makes no sense for, for your farming base to be flip-flopping, um, you know, when the market conditions suit them. Uh, for us, what we simply did was we we cut the contract, and um, no matter how hard that person wants to come back to us, they're never going to get another contract with us. I appreciate that, Matthew. Um, yeah. Roger, it, it's the old argument again about um, collectivism versus a free market. Yeah. Uh, a sugar factory can't run in an absolute free market. There must be collectivism, and so where the banana board still has uh, 80 or so participants in its global gap uh, audits. And the quality assurance manual is written for all of these different size farms. Uh, collectivism works uh, where a cocoa fermentria, not necessarily the big ones at Richmond and Morgan's past, but maybe uh, smaller, um, targeted fermentaries in Clarendon would work with collectivism and picking up the small farmers in a short distance drive uh, to pick up cocoa. That type of small farmer participation will work. But it doesn't mean that a small farmer can't put in uh, several hundred square feet of shade house and supply peppers and cucumbers to price smart at a top dollar and a high value, which is what Matthew was talking about. You gotta be careful how you harmonize your small farmers to be 
in a collective process or fighting tooth and nail in the free market. And we, we shouldn't confuse the two. Um, that being said, and if we go back to like Jakra, who's picked up what Marlene was promoting today, turmeric, ginger, pimento, as a regulated commodity. When you look at the impediment that's put in front of the small farmers to become a turmeric or ginger farmer, processor, seller of his own ginger abroad, the cost and regulatory Himalayan mountain that he has to climb will guarantee that no small farmers participate. So we need to tidy up ourselves in Jamaica and make it really user friendly and encourage small farmers. Work them collectively in the crops where they can express themselves, otherwise leave them to compete and don't impede them getting into the marketplace. Thank you. Thanks. And Rick, your final word on you on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a believer in the, the mother farm, satellite farm, and, and outgrowers. Um, we've had experience with friends who have done it on a massive scale in Kenya, and they were exporters of produce to Europe, and they had over 900 small farmers growing for them. So, it is possible, and they were all Global Gap certified, each one of these small holdings, but it was all steered and, and managed by the, by the mother farm. Um, I think a combination of what Raja is saying, we're, we're, we're scared about doing it too often because it, the, the, the food safety protocols that are required of us and the responsibility of our company in ensuring the safe food supply is always a little bit in a gray area when you have a person that is growing for you who you are not 110% sure will stick to the, the, the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you said, so we, for our exports, are scared of doing it. We've done it many, many times before. The moment we don't do it. But I do believe that it's a way to, if the cooperative production is a way to help coordinate the planting programs, the distribution, if you have many cooperatives working together, then you have a much better control of, not control, but a, the systems that Matthew talked about, you are able to design the systems where a mother farm or a, a, a satellite marketing arm can spread the information out and so that you can monitor and, and, and coordinate proper production calendars so that we don't have gluts and one part of the country or at one time of the year and it's more even and that's a way of helping get rid of it but it's it's all about dollars and cents if if a farmer feels that he's not making a good buck then it's not going to work it's yeah. a simple yeah. can i say something else on that no one go ahead go ahead Matthew. Um, I, I, I totally agree with what Ricky says, you know, if a farmer thinks that they're not getting a big enough piece of the pie, then they find somewhere else to, <laughs> to, to put their goods, right? Um, and I think part of the success that we've had um, with, with IF is, is that we have a, um, a slightly different model. So, you know, we, we say on the contract, this is what we're going to buy for, but we also say this is what we're planning to sell for. Um, and anything that we get that's above that sell price, we share it back with the farmers. And right? so shared risk, shared rewards. Um, so the farmers are generally more um, inclined to keep that contract and to keep, keep that set price because they know that if we, if we go, if the market turns favorably and we're getting a better price, that they're automatically going to get some of that too.
All right, so uh, the, the, the mother farm has a role to play in also making sure that it's fair across the board. Um, and that will lead to, 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 to better success throughout. Yeah, yeah. Listen, all insightful um, sharing. Um, we, have, we have come to uh, almost the end of, of the session. I just want to um, certainly thank the, you know, um, all of you for joining the webinar. We have been assailed with a torrent of, of information. I think it will probably take some time to sift through all that we have we have been you know have been shared with us and we trust that the session has been you know stimulating and stimulating enough for you to reach out to us here at Jam Pro to share your proposal and ideas. Uh, clearly, you know, with the panel that we have here, these speakers are very insightful. Um, before you you saw the panelists, we had honorable minister who had to leave us early. Um, we want to say a special thank you, um, you know, to, to him um, for, for joining the session. And indeed, special thank you to all the panelists. Uh, I don't know how you do this, um, you know, whether you give a round of applause because we are not all seeing you, but feel free to reach out on social media and, you know, let your post in reflect, say, the sentiment, um, you know, that has been shared with us uh, here. But, um, just, just to say um, thank you to the Honourable Minister who had to leave early uh, for taking time to share with us all of the you know, government plans for the, the sector, um, particularly just from my perspective, just want to say kudos to the government uh, on their initiative, um, the buyback initiative to help to save some of our farmers, certainly during this uh, COVID time. And, and you know, just coming out of that, you know, the acquisition, a lot of um, fresh produce. So, I mean, that's just my personal um, kudos reaching out to them. But, but clearly, with the five-year agribusiness strategy that is now in place, the minister spoke to that, um, you know, the formation of the Agricult Agriculture Council um, or Food and Security Working Group, all of these are, are you know, elements that are in place that we expect to see positive growth in the agribusiness to address a number of the areas that um, you know, we, we have um, spoke about. Um, you know, coming out of discussion, we talk about wanting to see a lot of structure um, in the industry. And I think the framework um, you know, through this um, agriculture uh, plan, if you will, will provide us a lot of that structure. So we'll see that unfolding uh, in the coming weeks, months. Um, I want to say also thanks to uh, Marlene for providing greater insights into the opportunities in the agribusiness space. As she indicated, there are a number of uh, opportunity profiles on the crops that we discuss, as well as others. Um, you know, she shared with us uh, insights around the opportunities for yam, sweet potato, ginger, turmeric, sorry, and of course, our mangoes. Um, all, um, you know, with our own unique taste. So we invite you to continue that conversation with, uh, with Marlene and our team here at Jam Pro um, as we uh, move out of the session. We're also especially grateful to our private sector partners in the form of Ricky Waite, Roger Turner, Matthew Lynn, um, to participate in this, this uh, morning's uh, webinar, clearly very insightful, um, you know, information, details that you have shared, um, even about your own business, how you have uh, endured to have the level of success that you are, and, and certainly creating a, a model for a number of other entities uh, to follow on. Um, the sector continue to depend on you and others like you to undertake the type of investment uh, to grow the sector. Your input into policy matters are also important for the sector advancement. And so we look forward to your continued um, partnership. And then your know, president, uh, Ms. Diane Edwards, who had to um, you know, leave a call earlier, I want to thank you for you know, efficiently um, chairing the program up to the point in time that you did, um, clearly bringing the opening remarks. Um, you have done a lot. Um, for us and your continued leadership at Jam Pro, um, you know, 
and in your continued leadership here at JamPro, and in particular in the agribusiness, which I, I personally believe have a, a soft spot, um, you know, uh, for you here. Uh, clearly, what we do here in in um, uh, the sectors that we cover is is key and important in driving the economic uh, growth in 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 Jamaica. And, and so we want to thank, you know, Dan for our effort in continue to, um, to lead our business. Uh, one of her mantra is that we're moving from agriculture into agribusiness. And, and clearly, you know, the role of technology is very key in that. We want to move away from seeing, you know, agriculture as a man with a hoe uh, and, and see, you know, agriculture or agribusiness as a man around a computer. So finally, I want to just express sincere gratitude to, to you, our audience, for taking the time to be part of the session and for your active participation in the Q&A. Uh, there are a significant number of questions that we have in the Q&A um, that, you know, whilst we're not able to address them on this, um, this, this forum, it's our intention to um, have a response prepared uh, and sent out to you. Um, your questions and inputs enrich the discussion from which I, I garnered uh, some of what we uh, engage with the panel. And so before you go, I just want to share with you some of the services that we offer to all investors across all sectors um, for which we service. Um, we continue to be business advocates as we work along with government um, to create an environment that allow for your business to thrive. Uh, so we support that. Uh, we also facilitate, you know, kind of market penetration. Uh, you heard from uh, you heard from Marlene earlier how we help our exporters penetrate markets um, overseas uh, as as part of you know facilitating uh, exports uh, for you. We do a lot of um, business matchmaking, um, not just on the export side, but even as we look to um, have investors. Uh, participate in in some of our our key assets here in Jamaica, and and you know we continue to provide uh, information to facilitate your continued growth and expansion as you look to um, take advantage of the business opportunities uh, here in Jamaica. So as a call to action, I just want to ask you to reach out to Jampro. Uh, get more insights and information and opportunity available to our various sectors. And of course, there is always our Do Business Jamaica website. I, I, there's a ton of information there. I implore you just, just engage on that website and we'll be you know, responsive to, to the issues, questions that you raise. For now, I just want to say thanks for your time and thank you again for joining us. And that's it. Peace out. Have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Right. Okay, bye. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye.